Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Jen, and I'm here today talking with uh, Corey Sterling of Pontius Council. And we're going to cover um, some key considerations, key legal considerations for teaching beyond the studio. Uh, so I just wanted to kick things off and introduce Corey. Um, he's a lawyer, a small business owner, a group fitness instructor, and yoga teacher. He wrote the Yoga Law Book um, and has served hundreds of clients in the health and fitness space. The majority of those are um, owners or operators of health and fitness studios. He's presented at conferences around the world, teaching about the law in a fun and practical way. So welcome, Corey. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, joining us from Brazil, I should add. So. In Brazil, <laughs> out, outside the gym, just finished my little post-gym smoothie here, and very Brazilian, very Brazilian. A lot of Brazilian things going on. Amazing. That's pretty cool that we have access to talk to a lawyer from a, outside a gym in Brazil. So thank you so much. Really appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and dive into some questions because I know these are considerations that are top of a lot of people's minds right now uh, as our whole world is, is sort of upside down as, as teachers and wellness professionals. Um, so first question is a lot of people have found themselves teaching either primarily or fully online since COVID hit. Um, so what sorts of legal protections should people have in place for teaching online, whether that's in a live stream capacity or in a recorded format? The most important thing about teaching online is realizing that the activities and the way that you're, the activities that you're offering and the services that you are offering as well um, are different than when they used to be. So one of the biggest things, like a little bit of context about me. So we've got all of these clients all over the world who operate health and, and wellness businesses of some sorts. And, um, there's, I would sort of divide all of the clients into two different types. So there's proactive and there's reactive. Proactive clients are the ones who realize that, okay, the landscape of how I'm doing my work and, and how my clients are interacting with my brand have changed. And I should probably update my legal agreements as a result of that. And then there are those who sort of just sweep everything under the rug. No judgment at all. Love, I love everyone equally. It's, it's no judgment. But then there are some clients who will then you know, not, not address sort of the legal needs because before they met me, law wasn't fun, but now law magically has become a lot of fun. Um, and and the, the, the biggest issue around operating online is like the proactive ones acknowledge and accept that, okay, things are different now than they were before. And the mm -hmm. way that I'm providing my services and the types of relationships I have, like my whole, my whole thing, my whole understanding about law is like, law is navigating a series of relationships and within each relationship, you want to communicate your expectations openly and honestly. And if you're able to do that, you really avoid 99.9% .9 of the problems that are going to come up in the course of your business with the law. Um, so as I was saying, like the proactive clients are like, okay, well, I'm doing things completely differently now than I used to do them before. So I should probably have my agreements updated to reflect that. Whereas um, the reactive clients, usually it'll be like, you know, a lot of people withdrawing from a retreat or withdrawing from a studio or wanting their money back or like some sort of jarring moment where everything's, it's like a pressure cooker, everything builds up and then one day it just boils over. Um, and then at that point they need, they need to fix their agreements, but their agreements mm -hmm. aren't in a good enough position to, to, to help them. So the, the mm -hmm. biggest things that we've been focusing on are waivers of liability, service agreements, privacy policy, terms of service, and online disclaimers. And we can go into the specifics around that. And mm -hmm. also relationships that we have with our team. So either contract or employee agreements. Gotcha. And, and, I, and I, I just wanna just say one other, one other thing because like the world is different now than it was before. And I, I've also like in the legal practice that I've built, I've taken a different approach than most traditional lawyers. And what I've learned is that Firstly, you have to understand the practical aspect of how law really works, right? So it's not like something's going to happen. There's going to be a miscommunication of expectation or a misalignment of communication between parties. And then like someone's going to want something. So someone's been injured or they want their money back or they're not satisfied or whatever it is. The, like the, 
the first, and, and I think a lot of people traditionally, and this is probably because of the media or other things, people are like, oh my God, like I'm gonna get sued. And I just, I have to tell people like from the hundreds and hundreds of clients that I work with, less than 0.01% actually get sued. Like getting sued means someone has gone to a court, they filed papers, they're bringing an action against you and like it's on Donkey Kong, which very, very rarely, rarely, rarely happens because everything settles. But in the first, like the first 15% of that sort of jockeying for legal position, that's where as a lawyer, you know, I'll receive a demand letter and I'm gonna have to respond on behalf of my client. So someone is aggrieved, someone is upset, someone is angry. And then I'm going to sit at my computer outside the gym and I'll be like, okay, um, well, let's see what written agreement did the parties have in place? Do we have anything signed? What evidence do we have of this? And like, and I, for my clients, I try to front load everyone with awesome agreements so that we don't get past the first 10% of the process. But conversely, like even as of yesterday, and if you want stories, I've got a lot of stories, but Yesterday, I was working with a client who did not have the appropriate documentation in place. Three people wanted to withdraw from a retreat. And it's like, what could have been me taking a screenshot on my computer and having the document speak for itself and be like, hey, you know, you signed an agreement that said that we had flexibility to cancel the dates of our retreat and you still signed this. But absent to those things being in the agreement, that's when momentum for the other side builds. And that, that's when it's like, it gets drawn out and more expensive and stressful. And then, you know, and then it's like something that could have just been brushed away that now is becoming a problem. So I just, I just have to share that because you will hear me speak about these types of documents with great passion. And the passion stems from a place of like, A, you know, I've not, my, not my first rodeo by any means. And B, like, I just see everyone sort of making the same mistakes and we, I know exactly what everyone needs. So use legal documents and, and, you know, I'm happy to share all this information about what should be included in those documents. So I hope that helps. Yeah, that's really helpful. And I love the way you framed it around the fact that it goes back to relationships. And part of this is just, if you're proactive, you have kind of the right, the right um, documentation and agreements in place uh, in advance. Most of this stuff hopefully is never going to arise. And come up and there's not going to be any conflict or or issue to, to sort of uh, have to <laughs> have a headache around. Um, I think that's so important. It's like people often think about this stuff once it becomes a problem. And really, to your point, uh, it's just so much better for everybody involved if there's some thought that goes into it at the front end. So those are all really helpful thoughts. Thank you. Cool. Um, I guess just to kind of piggyback a little bit on that first question, um, the other thing people are doing a lot more of is teaching outside, um, both kind of in public places like parks or hiking trails, but also sometimes on private property, um, like you might be at a meditation center, a retreat center, that kind of thing. Um, so does a lot, I mean, I think it sounds like a lot of what you've covered also would apply to teaching outside, um, but is there any other considerations people need to keep in mind if they're teaching in, in these other alternative outside spaces? Anything in particular there? Yes, for sure. Um, I think one thing, the, the, the safety net for all of, all of us, our entire community is, is insurance. So the one yeah. thing that we wanna make sure is that whatever it is that we're doing or we're planning on doing, that we, we make sure that our insurance policy covers us for those activities. And there's a really fun game that you can play if you want. Do you wanna know the name of the game? Sure. The game is called Call Your Insurance Broker and ask them exactly what your coverage includes. And it, it can be that fun. For me, um, when I had to do this, I used to run a yoga festival in Ontario and mm -hmm. we had all these different activities, swimming, hiking, blah, 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 all the things. And I would call my insurance provider and I, would, I drink, usually I drink yerba mate. So I have like my mate and my straw and I'd be like, well, we're planning on doing this. Does this cover it? And some people might go to someone's personal farm under the festival. Will we be covered for that? Blah, 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 blah. So it's a really fun yeah. game. Anyone with an insurance policy can play it. Everyone's eligible to play that game. Um, but, but, but really in a practical sense, the most important thing you wanna do is understand and make sure that your insurance covers you. Second, like insurance is here. And like the next thing that goes hand in hand with it is your waiver of liability. So I'm like, 
yeah, if, if I'm, a, I'm a big fan of waivers of liability, I wrote a book called the yoga law book and I did a lot of research into waivers of liability while writing that book. And I've drafted a lot of waivers of liability since the reason why a waiver of liability is so important is because most of the other agreements that you're going to be using or that you're going to be signing involve two parties that are agreeing to something. So they're saying, mm -hmm. Hey, you know, I'm going to do this. You're going to do this, this, and within that, like we know the extent of the damages that we may owe, right? Like, let's say I'm telling, I'm selling a retreat and the spot is $3,000 and blah, blah, blah. Something happens. Someone wants to cancel this, that, or the other. Okay. I've received the $3,000. They're not really likely to have accrued any damages as a result of this. So I'm going to pay back the $3,000. So cool. We know exactly what it is. When it comes to waiver of liabilities, it's different because when you have a responsibility to make sure that someone's going to be safe when you're facilitating an activity for them, we don't, we don't know what the scope of the damages potentially could be. You could, they could either just get hurt doing the activities on their own, like however it happens, or it could be that you, you know, did something outside of what you normally do or the mats weren't prepared properly, or you didn't sterilize and clean things, whatever it is. Like now there's 17 million things that you can do wrong. <laughs> And as a result, like you could have someone who is participating in a class or an activity with you is 31 years old, has, you know, uh, has a really good job where they're earning $170,000 a year. They have to take, you know, X number of months off of work. In addition to that, their quality of living will never be the same. They can't like whatever. I don't want to get into quantum of damages, but it's just like, we yeah. don't know how bad it can be and how deep that hole of liability and exposure can be. So like have a great waiver of liability that covers you for all of the activities and all of the risks. And I, and I just want to like hammer home a couple of really, really important points. So mm -hmm. yes, now we are doing things in like our neighbor's garage where we used to do them in a studio or <clears throat> any other, you know, a variety of different places. A waiver is only as good as the specificity of the activities that it covers. So okay. the thing to know is that a, if let's say, if we just say teaching yoga, teaching yoga in a studio is different than teaching yoga online or having on demand content that people are consuming, right? Because you're not able to monitor. You can't, uh, you can't view them participating. You don't know what the space that they're performing is safe. Like so many variables, maybe they're using props wrong. There's, there's, it needs to be changed because the activities are different. And, and that's the same sort of like when it comes to being in public parks or outdoors, or if you do stand up paddle or all these sorts of things, like you just turn your mind to making sure that you cover the activities and what the risks of those activities are. Yeah, great. So lesson being don't have one liability waiver that you drafted 10 years ago, and now you're teaching a totally different style of yoga or movement modality in a totally different place. It's so the sort of thing that should be more dynamic and more specific. Um, yeah, that's, that's because, really helpful. Thank you. Well, it's, it's also just ev everything that I share comes home, like from sheer experience. Law school yeah, is really yeah. different than being a lawyer. So like for me, okay. the, mo the thing that I learned the most was one of the first files that I had when I started my practice was someone who was doing area got injured doing aerial yoga. Mm -hmm. And the, the, all of the, and again, like the buck can stop immediately. If you have a great waiver that covers aerial and all the risks of aerial and whatever it is, it's like, Hey, your client signed this in this state, someone is allowed to sign away their legal rights. So long as it is not ambiguously drafted, blah, blah, blah. But mm -hmm. the challenge is like, we didn't have that in the waiver. And so I just know that like that whole issue that dragged on for months and cost thousands and thousands of dollars would have been resolved at the start if we had the right documentation. Right. That's great. Thank you. Um, so we've been talking a lot about uh, people doing self posting of classes and workshops, immersions, retreats, kind of all, all the things. Um, but these are things that are generally sort of organized, marketed, facilitated by, by teachers directly to their students. Um, so what has sort of changed about this, uh, these types of events since COVID, these self hosted events? Um, and kind of what what maybe should people be adapting in their in their playbooks or in their documentation, their agreements, uh, specifically around uh, COVID. Specifically around COVID. So, it, you know, the thing that it always comes down to is what are the activities and what are the risks? 
And now like the added layer to every activity we're doing is that there is a communicable disease that is very dangerous and very contagious that is out there. So the, the first thing is A, making sure that all of the documentation addresses this new activity and the new risks, right? So the activity is different because it used to be yoga, but now it's yoga with a communicable disease. And, and the reason why you're, it's your responsibility as a facilitator to include that is because at law, you have something that's called a duty of care, which basically means like you have to make sure anyone that is doing something with you is going to be safe. Like there's a, and then depending on a lot of circumstances, there will be ver a varying scale of how careful you have to be. But just as a basic principle for all of us today, like if you are the one facilitating something, you have to make sure that someone's gonna be safe in doing that activity with you. So the fact that there's a communicable disease going around and you're still deciding to facilitate things in person means you sort of accept that responsibility. And it's your job to make sure that everyone like, Legally, it's your responsibility to make sure everyone's going to be safe. So with COVID, A, we want to update the documents to include um, everything that's COVID related and including these risks and the outcomes. Other things, other considerations is one is like having really, really clear policies of, of like behavioral policies and systems of how things work, especially mm -hmm. much so less online because online, right? There's, you, people aren't interacting, so there's no risk of that. But specifically to COVID, it's like you want to have a plan where it's like, okay, you have to clean your mat before or when you enter, you have to clean your mat and you always have to wear a mask. And if something's, you know, if you test positive or you're exposed, God forbid, in a certain number of days, you have to let us know and blah, blah, blah. And like the, the biggest risk that business owners will come up against for with COVID will be negligence, which will be that like there was something that they should have done to make mm -hmm. sure everyone's safe that they didn't do. So for me as a lawyer in, you know, um, in, in harmony with everything that I've shared, in the event that someone is going to make such a claim, you're gonna wanna have a, like, proof and evidence and support that like you took it really seriously, you, you told people exactly how to behave, you, you managed all of the risks that you po possibly could. And like, just an, as an example, if you've got a team, this is like how the world is different now in, in October, 2020. But if you've got a team and you're and you have a team meeting where you're talking about health um, system, not health systems, but like health procedures and systemic, you know, how everyone's going to operate in this business, like record it on Zoom and keep it in the yeah. cloud, as you referred to. Um, we, I still haven't seen this cloud, but I hear a lot about it. Um, <laughs> oh, but yeah. you, you want to, for me, as a, again, as a, the practical, practical aspect of law, you're gonna want more things that are in your favor. And in the event that someone's like, oh, well, I came to your workshop and then I got sick afterwards and blah, blah, blah. You signed this agreement. Uh, we posted the information in the studio. We sent you an email beforehand and we trained all of our staff of which we have this evidence. In the and then it's like, then the moment, there's so much momentum taken away from the other side that mm -hmm. I don't wanna say it becomes a non-issue, but it becomes very, very, very difficult for that person to have a strong legal position and scare you into a settlement. Yeah, yeah, I love that. It goes all back to the first point you made on proactivity and, and kind of getting out in front of the stuff um, makes a lot of sense. So what I wanted to ask about next is just um, the fact that, and sort of alluded to this before, but these days when we're, you know, kind of reinventing how it is that we work, um, a lot of us are doing more work independently, um, self, as I mentioned, self hosting different types of offerings uh, that maybe at one point would have been, you know, in a studio context. So what's legally what's different about working uh, as, you know, it totally independently versus as a contractor and employee of a studio or I, I guess online of a streaming service, but basically underneath kind of another entity as opposed to totally independently. So if you're the, probably like a making sure you pay your taxes properly is just yeah. just like that's not even that's an accountant thing. But if, yeah. if you're used to if we're talking about the separation between like if employees and contractors are here and now it's you operating as your own business, it's like then the questions are like, do you have the appropriate business license? Do you have insurance that I like if you've created an LLC or 
you know, a company, does the insurance, is the insurance connected to the LLC or the company? Are you covered for all of these things and like making sure that your assets are safe? But the, the thing to know is like, if, if we're talking straight, it's, it's pretty simple if you're just an independent business owner, because then everything that you're creating in terms of intellectual property, all of the amount of clients, like there's no issues of things like non-solicitation or non-compete uh, or needing a media release or any sort of those things. So it's sort of like if you started your own business, just make sure you have the appropriate licenses that, you know, you have a separate business bank account and, and sort of all of these general type things. Um, and then just legally, the most alarming and glaring principle would be make sure that your assets are protected. So just the idea of incorporating a separate legal entity, if you, ha if you have assets um, personally, like you own a home or you've got a car, you've got a lot of investments or whatever it is, it, there are many instances where it makes sense to register a separate legal entity because in doing so, the operations of your business are different than your personal assets and you, the extent of your liability is only to the extent that that legal entity, right? Like the assets of the business, not your personal assets. When it comes to the, does, does that help? Does that make sense? Yeah, I was going to ask, I think the, the following question is probably top of a lot of people's minds, at least in the U.S. I think people consider um, LLCs as, as a way to do that is for a lot of independent teachers that are self-hosting their own offerings, basically operating as their own business, is that often the right kind of uh, legal entity or what would be other considerations and anything else you have kind of in terms of what that entails and costs and stuff, that would be great to know. Too. Yeah, the, the, the LLC question is not single dimensional. So there are, okay. a variety. it's always going to be a big picture perspective and looking at how much you're earning, what what assets you have, uh, and also usually like the nature of risk that's involved in the particular activity. So when we talk about creating a separate legal entity, usually it'll be like, what are your assets? How risky is the business that you're operating? And what are the tax implications of the decisions? You can be a sole proprietor if you're just starting on your own. You can you can be a sole proprietor if you and and again you need substantial assets for it to be worthwhile to register a legal entity. Or also like if you just wanted for peace of mind, if you're like, cool, I just want everything separate. So then I'll register an LLC. Um, but the other, like you're gonna wanna speak to an accountant always. It's always okay. that the, the, the registration of a separate legal entity is 50% law, 50% tax. What I can say from the legal perspective is that it's a great thing to do because you just you have that peace of mind that your personal assets will always be safe and like here's a great example if you've signed a lease and you sign it on behalf of your llc and you did not give a personal guarantee and this is i have a lot of clients who are going through this unfortunately like you can the, the llc can declare bankruptcy you get out of the lease not like you know i'm not saying that that's whatever it is what it is yeah, but that, it at is least in that instance like the the landlord's not able to come after your home or other assets that you have and like mm -hmm. so that's an example where like it, it makes sense but if, if you're more of a um you know solo practitioner just one-on-one -on -one clients with insurance and the right legal documents you can be totally you can be in great shape okay that's great to know thank you um so kind of pivoting to the last set of considerations i wanted to think about um in the U.S. at least right now, there are a lot of legislative shifts going on around how studios treat their teachers uh, in terms of if they're employees or contractors. Um, so what, what should people know about this and, and how can they stay informed kind of concerning the ongoing legislative process? Yes, so um, it's, it's an issue. It certainly is an issue. And California is the leader of, of all of this. In Portuguese, we would call it a bagunça. Bagunza is just like a big mess. It's just like, it's a mess. Yeah. So California, yeah. and, and I'll speak about California, but let me just give the, the practical information first to everyone. Understand okay. that while there are federal implications regarding the contractor employee distinction and classification, oftentimes it will be driven by state legislation about what, what relevant tests will decide whether or not someone is a contractor and employee. So for example, in the state, the state of Connecticut, has the exact same test that the original AB5 has, which is a three-pronged test, which basically in Connecticut, it says, 
if someone is performing services which are the same services that your business offers at law they are an employee okay the state of florida conversely applies applies what is called the control test so and that's also what the irs will use in the event of an audit so they will say how much control does the employer have over the person who's doing the work and then there's a whole variety of considerations like you know uh what are the hours like are they allowed to tell them specifically how to do the work who owns the intellectual property are there uniforms how does payment work is it invoiced are people incentivized to, to earn more money based on the way based on the work that they're doing and it's like it, it will always be a big picture perspective where they look at everything so the first thing to know is it will be a state by state determination and if you if you want to know you can just go to google and put in like whatever your state is let's just go north dakota right north dakota contractor test employment law right then you obviously make sure that whatever you're reading is a reputable source and probably read two or three, but they will let you know whatever's happening, right? The thing to know about legislative changes is that A, it, there's, there's a very big time difference in the whole legislative process of when a bill is drafted, when it's read out, when it's voted on, when it's implemented, and then like when actually it begins. So AB, let's, well, I'll talk about AB5 for a moment and then the sub, subsequent AB5527, just because, yeah, because it's, it, I, it's obviously something that's interesting to me and I think it's relevant to everyone who's listening because it also yeah. shows how government and law is alive and fluid. So first they came out with AB5 and they have this three-pronged test called the ABC test, which is basically anyone who offers a service, which is the same service of the business, automatically is an employee. So I'll never forget November 20, and January 1, 2020 was the date of implementation where it was like, that's when we're starting. November 2019, December 2019, I just had like so many clients who wanted to switch from contractors to employees, completely illogical. It was like, you know, a retreat center that would have people that were coming and, you know, whatever it was, once or studios, someone would teach two hours a month who technically now at law was an employee. And, and I remember as you people would always ask me, like, do you think I should do it? Is it blah, blah, blah. And as a lawyer, you know, you know, did you know at law school, there's a class that's, that, that's called, it depends. <laughs> I love that. That's funny. No, they I just, they just that. teach you that you <laughs> always have to answer. It depends whenever anyone asks you. I did yeah, pretty well sure. in that class. Final exam was oral. They just <laughs> try to trick you to really questions that you should be certain. And you always have mm -hmm. to answer. It depends. It Anyways. Depends. So my clients were like, oh, do I really have to shift? Do I have to do this? And I would say, it depends. This is what the law says. You know, if you mm -hmm. want my personal professional opinion that you accept with caveats, this is my personal professional opinion. And what I, what I said was that eventually it will be changed. And I don't think that the government of California is really looking, even though there was, there was a wave in 2017 and 2018 of a lot of audits of yoga and wellness studios. I was like, I don't think that they're coming for mom and pop yoga studios to like barging down the door looking for the yoga teacher who teaches once a week right. and then and there was like and i worked with a woman named katie santos who's like sort of she's a friend and a client but also a teacher of mine and we were like writing letter i was helping her write letters to legislators in sacramento and we were like hey this doesn't work for our industry blah 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 september 4th 2020 california released something called ab5527 which was basically them changing, uh, changing the legislation from AB5. So it only really made, it made it nine months long. And then they were just like, okay, we really screwed this up. So now we're gonna change it to be something else. And there's a variety and it's the other tricky part about law is like, normally you need something that's called a seminal case. And when you have a seminal case, then it, that case will like, there will be, there's right, right now, there's so much confusion about contractor employee stuff. And like, it would be great for everyone if there was a case that went to a judge and a judge gave like a whole long, re, you know, decision yeah. about yoga studios and contractors and employees. But like, until you get to a test case, you don't really know. So we right. haven't really gotten, we haven't really gotten there in the wellness industry, which is where we focus. Um, but the thing with AB5527 is like, now they've listed exceptions to AB5. So AB5 still applies, but like two exceptions that are relevant to our industry 
One is called like the one-off exception, which means like if someone's just driving through town and they do a workshop and they leave and they never come back, they that is an exception to the the the, the three-prong test. And as well, there's a business to business exception where it's like if there's a business who is using the ser service of another business, that technically is an exception to AB5527. Maybe I went into too much detail, no. but it, like the takeaway is yeah. A, look at your jurisdiction and B, recognize that all laws are always changing. And, and this yeah. is like my call and I'm happy that we're recording this. There will yeah. be a change in something related to landlord tenant laws related with everything that's happening there will be some governmental reform because it's it's both parties are losing terribly now and there needs to be some change and yeah. that's it yeah so short answer is it depends we're waiting for oh, uh, you a, a major decision uh to to be handed down that will sort of clarify a lot of these things depends on the jurisdiction and uh, yeah, and everybody, you know, stay involved in your legislative process, stay informed, and you know, hopefully, we'll find find a resolution to this that actually makes sense for our industry at, at some point down the line. But yeah, right now, it is a, it is definitely a can of worms to open up. So anyway, thank you for all that detailed information. That's that's really great. Um, but before we wrap up, I just wanted to quickly ask. Um, where can people find out more about you, the Loga, Yoga Law Book, and Conscious Council? They can, they can go to our website, ConsciousCouncil.ca, and I can, I can share a link for the Yoga Law Book. Um, and okay. also, what we're going to do is I'm going to open up some times if anybody wants to have a, a consultation and ask some questions. So if it's something like if you've heard this talk and you are either serious about legal documents or you, know, you really are um, committed to moving forward at best legal practices and being proactive, I'll include a link to my calendar and you can just book in a time and, um, and yeah, and that'll be super. And I'll send that to you and you can post that in the group and thank otherwise you. lovely to meet everyone. This has been a crazy amount of fun for me. Yeah. Thank you so much, Corey. Really appreciate your time. Um, and thanks for everyone who's watching this. Hopefully you found it helpful and, uh, yeah, everyone have a great Friday. Thanks. Thanks for listening.